Yeah, I'll start. Okay, guys. Uh, everyone here. Yeah. yeah. Um. So module two is supposed to build off of module one. Um. A lot more. Could again some more of the um data structures that we'll be working with. Um. Kind of addressing a lot of the problems that are brought up in the first module. Um. Oh, I should probably start with the mic. Um. And then uh, we'll go over some ways of manipulating these data structures to answer or ask questions, as well as doing some sorts of um, analyses, but like really just running things on the data to solve some common problems or things you might run into. Um, the crux of this module will be the lab, but I'll try to introduce as much as I can in the, in the slides. I recommend referring back to them if you have questions or big pictures, um, yeah, a lot more in the slides. Cool. Okay, so we'll start with just a refresher. This is a slide that Ben had previously um, presented, but uh, just to sort of go back, there's a bunch of different sort of types of data that you can work with when you're trying to discover biomarkers. Ideally, you would use patient data because at the end of the day, the biomarkers you derive should be working on patients. But obviously there's challenges with that. There's a limited number of patient cohorts available. Um, obviously you can't do that extensive um, testing on patient data. And so typically what's done is we use preclinical models. So things like cell lines or even um, patients are xenograph models, which are mice models. And we do our biomarker discovery testing and everything there. And then afterwards we translate into um, patient data. So the order of operations, may I say, is you do your biomarker discovery here and you sort of start validating this way. Um, and hopefully by here, you get a biomarker robust enough that you can confidently assess in patients, um, patient data where the data is available. Again, most of this is going to be retrospective. How do I switch slides? Okay. Um, so let's talk about sort of the data sets that are available for this. Um, starting with the preclinical data, this is mostly going to be cell line data, um, which is going to be highlighted in, I think this is red. And then anything in the green or purple are mice data. Um, and these are all publicly available data sets that have either drug response data or radiation um, outcomes. Um, so you can see the data collection primarily started around the late 90s. And since then, there's been a huge accumulation. Um, you can see the number of cell lines. There's actually really big data sets here. And this is large enough for you to run um, your biomarker discovery models and even larger models once we get into sort of the deep learning side. Um, but sort of, I guess, when you're starting to do your biomarker discovery, if you're looking for data to use, we would recommend um, looking into one of these. We've already actually worked with the CCLE data as well as GDSC. Um, so those were two examples that we sort of pulled down. And then once you sort of have your biomarkers, then you tested them in cell lines, they're working great. If you're looking to validate in patient data, we've also sort of just listed here a few publicly available um, patient cohorts or collections of patient cohorts. Um, so common ones, TCGA, we actually talked about earlier today. Um, but there's some databases where people can upload their private um, or sort of curated patient data, um, as well as some other databases and data um, consortiums that have tumor data from patients, as well as outcome data, so how they performed after being treated with different drugs. So these are all resources for everyone here once you're actually doing your projects. If you need data to work with, we recommend um, looking into these. I mean, uh, we go back to the slide. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice some of them have logos above them. Some, well, most of the time, you'll have these public organizations who do this work and then um, release the data to the public. Um, but if you can imagine, a lot of like pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies will do this a lot more. So I, way more cell lines, way more drugs, a lot more data, and they'll release it because it's um, But like Genentech's a great, a great company and we work with them as well. Um, they they release their data and they also release a lot of packages to, to work with their data. Um, so if you guys do ever work for a company, it, it can it can add to this list one day. But yeah, I wanted to point that out. And also you know the next slide, these resources um we refer refer back to many times, but something like the SRA, you can get like raw, fast use um files for it. It's just a matter of do you guys have the resources to work with them. Um, so for CCLE, for example, it's about 50 terabytes of data for a thousand cells. 
and I've read them, I'm sure you've seen computers and some how to administrate on them. So you'll have to like, you know, either get access to like HPC computing or some higher resources. Um, but then, and then um, they also release some form of process data, which is what GDSC has done. So GDSC also has their private data, but they have some form of process data in that website that we saw later. So you can pick and choose what you want to work with um, and the five that you want to implement as well. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's really useful information. Um, if you are discussing the future, if you could walk in. Oh, the mic, yes. Oh, just okay. Can I pull it yeah. through over? <laughs> okay, so all we've been talking about is data, data, data. That was a really good segue if I say so myself. Oh, and this is actually where I got the statistic from. So like I said, 80% of the time, data scientists are wrangling with data. And then once the data is ready to use, only then do they actually get to do the analysis. And in the earlier module, we got to see why that's the case. Um, and so even when you're looking at data sets that are published, for example, a paper comes out, they have a new data set, they do analyses with it. Um, when they actually publish the publication and the data, there's usually very limited information on how the data was processed, very little metadata, um, usually not even code on how they did it. And so it's really hard to sort of reproduce um, results. Even when they release their data, you can't actually get the same values that they had um, when they're doing their analysis. And so this is a really big problem. Um, this is also a figure that we showed earlier. This is a big problem for bioinformatics biomarker analysis specifically because there's so many data components that come into it. We have, like we showed earlier, the drug response data, the molecular profiles, the metadata for the cell lines, or even the metadata for the um, the profiles and the drug response. So there's a lot of data sort of objects that we have to keep track of um, and collect and sort of store and even just organize. Um, and that's a huge problem when it comes to doing bioinformatics, not even just bioinformatics, but any sort of data scientist um, work. And so our lab has sort of come up with a package as well as some sort of um, objects that we hope will facilitate this. And so we're gonna sort of talk about um, some of those things now. Cool. So I brought this up in the first module, but to bring it back now, the, the idea of standardizing the ways that we work or structure and containerize data and the formats that we want to work with that work with them um, has, I think, always been a problem. And one of the earliest solutions that uh, the BHK lab started with was to create an R package that would one implement some standards, but then also work with the types of data that we wanted to work with. Um, and so we had a, a couple of goals uh, at the time was just pharmacogenomic data. And could we, I think this started with when the CCLE and GDSC data sets were released and finding a way to standardize them so that you could compare them. And to do so took a lot of thought and effort, but they ended up releasing the first version of the package, which has um, performed pretty pretty well. And the idea behind that was to, one, work with large amounts of data with a standard and being able to efficiently compute over it, um, as well as to share it with other people. So with those in mind, um, Formico GX was born and it's hosted on Bioconductor. Does anyone here not know what Bioconductor is? Okay, cool. And that's a good reason to explain. So we have CRAN, right? Which is like your normal repository of, of uh, R packages. Bioconductor is like a subset where it's specialized for biology, like, like the sciences and, and the work that we they do. And so I couldn't really tell you why they had to do one just for bio stuff, but um, there are a lot of standard and highly used packages uh, on there. If, if anyone's ever worked with summarized experiments, it really is, well, come, it comes back to that sample by feature matrix, right? Can you, if you can organize it in that level, and as Julia kind of explained as well, being able to have metadata associated with it, um, and then those ideas just grow. So uh, Pharmaco just kind of learned from that. Um, we inherited a lot of that functionality and um, and being able to work with also treatment response data or drug response data um, became important for us. So that's, that's where the package was kind of born. Um, this is an overview, overview of the package. Um, I want to take the mic on me, but uh, just so I can point towards them, we have um, 
at the core of it, I'll get into like more detail when we in, in the lab, but we have a bunch of slots. And what slots are is consider it like 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 links to other data structures. So annotation is just like how do you want to like the, anything you want to describe about it. So if you want to describe that this pharmacal set is from a certain place or the dates that they uh, it was made, um, treatment uh, is the drugs in this sense. Historically, and you might actually see this if you worked with any pharmacal sets. Oh, I should also say we have pharmacal GX, which is the package. Pharmacal sets are a class in pharmacal GX that um, that is the container. Um, so the idea, right, is you have molecular profiles, which are kind of what Julia was going through in module one. Um, anything regarding the profiles of these samples or cell lines. Then we have treatment response, which is how those samples of cell lines um, are, react to draw, uh, treatments. But this concept was later like um, abstracted to what's called a core set because we started working with radiation therapy um, as well as toxical therapy, I believe. But and so the I the concept behind this the the structures involved was then abstracted to what we call core GX um, that all had the same things. And so it's very similar. You have treatments, you have samples, they're just no longer cell lines, right? You have patients or well, what have it. And so this can be used across other fields as well. And that was kind of the idea here. For the sake of this um, workshop, we're only looking at pharmacal GX and pharmacal sets. Uh, but just keep in mind that so this is the response, um, the treatment response or and drug response, and this is the molecular profiles of the samples or cell lines. Then we also keep metadata, which is also curated. I'll get to that as well about the samples and the the treatments. So, for example, we we saw the GDSC samples um, that were used or the cell lines there. There are pretty common cell lines. We, we already saw one on Cellosaurus, and on Cellosaurus, there's a lot of information about that cell line that um, you could refer back to. So to help um, our own work, but also the people that we're sharing with, we kind of add that metadata from those databases to the pharmacal set. So you have access to that locally without having to go fetch it yourself. Um, similarly, for the drugs that are, are used in uh, these experiments, we also collect metadata from you know PubChem, Campbell, Drug Bank. There's a bunch of actually a lot of them for the, for the treatments, and we store that in the treatment frame. So the pharmacal set as a whole is tries to be containerize all this information, uh, as well as mapping between everything. So you can have like one interface that's actually pretty simple to work with if you work with like a data frame, um, and you can like subset by you can so if you have like let's say a pharmacal set for a thousand cell lines and a thousand drugs, you can then subset out for the drug that you want and get a smaller object that you can work with. Um, and the main idea, like I said, was if we could have one of these and for one data set and another one for another data set and then be able to analyze them or, or reference them and compare. So that's where the curation slot comes in, which is a bit more tedious where it, what it tries to do is standardize a way of the cell lines that you'll find in CCLE, for example. If they're named non-standardly, then the curation slot will have a mapping from any standard that we we ha have our own standard of naming it to the ones that CCLE provides. And then in GDSC, we'll do the same thing. We'll have the GDSC sample names, but in the curation slot, we'll have our mapping. And so the functions that we provide in Pharmacal GX allow you to use the curation slot to then compare between two cell lines. Does that make sense? I, I want to get more into it later, but um, I just wanted to show you guys the overview structure of this. Um, now to uh, also, if you see here, I've also annotated the what these slots are. So in, in treatment, it's a data frame, but in annotation, it's a list. So you can have anything in, in this. Um, in sample, it's a data frame. In molecular profile, it's a multi-assay experiment. Who here has worked with a multi-assay experiment before? Okay, one. Okay, so it's, it's okay. So we'll probably should get into that as well. And then treatment response experiment is another class 
that we've um, built and developed. So what if and you could think of a pharmaco set is a class of classes. So it's like a big container to hold class other containers in it. Um, and so historically, this was something. This was just a list. Now it's a, we built this to handle the large data that we deal with. Um, and we'll get into I'll ask you the examples in the tutorial will help a lot more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And rice and preservation and even the data sets and wireless and generic is never the same. Yeah, it's never the same. And you like the dominance and the field from when you can switch to the we actually, I think the, the decision was made to leave that up to the analysis, like, the, you know, how they want to do that themselves. We don't try to normalize anything from the raw data that we get. So we'll go through an example as well. Exactly. Yeah, so a good example, I think, um, is, which we'll actually see as well in the tutorial, is if you get a treatment uh, drug dose data, for um, an experiment, well, they'll have like one cell line, one drug, and then maybe eight concentrations, right? Um, but then they'll also do repeat that experiment multiple times. So now for a given cell and a given drug, a given sample and a concentration, you might have multiple values. So there's different ways of choosing what you want, how you want to approach that or what you want to do with it. You may want to keep all that data, but we just decided to give you that like the liberty and freedom to choose that on your own and we'll provide that at least we give you like the structure and the way to do it and we kind of standardize that for you yes exactly exactly yeah so in this one of the standards that we've been implementing uh for these uh that we're working on now is the sources of the data that we get um Usually, for the most part, they're like public sources. And so we want to, what we try to do is we try to annotate everything that you see here. We'll have a link or explanation of where we got it from. Um, so you can always refer back to like If you click the link now and it's gone, uh, that that just happens, actually. And you kind of have to deal with it. But we, we put that all inside here as well, because you'll be working with us at a given point in time. And you'll also, like I said, have a version that was built on a specific date that might be different than what's available right now. So we, all that information we try to contain within one thing so that you can always have an understanding of what you're working with. And if you wanted to distribute it, you have the same version as someone else. Um, and you can always compare. Any questions about this that I can answer from, from this? Okay, cool. We'll get into the multi-assay experiment. So this is um this took me a while to comprehend, but who here has worked with some experiments that we have? Yeah, they, they, there's also, so there is, so they, what they do is they have the summarized experiment, which is like the parent, and they'll like inherit those for sub, you know, for their own specific thing. So the single cell has their own version of summarized experiment as well, um, because it's such a good concept and they just kind of do the same thing for wherever field it is. But it's also always the same um, idea behind it. So the, uh, I should label this better, but on the, on the right is the summarized experiments on the left is the multi assay experiment. So just think that there's like a label up there. So uh, you see the experiments. Oh, wait, sorry. Flip that. On the right is the multi assay experiment. On the left is the summarized experiment. Um, so you, we see here this the assays. So the, those um, sample by feature matrices that we were looking at, those are your assays. They're called assays here, but just consider the same thing um, where you have samples as columns and features as rows. And so you could have, in a given summarized experiment, you could have multiple assays, given that they're all the same congruency, I think is the word, right? The same dimensions. You could have the same assays. Um, so for 
the same sample, same exact same number of samples and the exact same features, you could have multiple assays. I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but it's possible. Um, but say you're working with, let's say the GDSC data that we saw where the dimensions of these sample feature matrices are not the same. What you, what they've built actually is a, another container of containers. So the multi-assay experiment is a container of summarized experiments. So then for each specific data, you create a summarized experiment and then you combine a list of them into a multi-assay experiment. That way you can kind of compare and you, you have the standard, standardize the sample names and everything. So now you have one big container of all those expression or um, like RNA-seq or mutation data um, compacted into one container. It's a lot harder to do that, of course. It takes a while to the data wrangling behind that, but that's the goal. And once you have a multi-assay experiment, you can start subsetting based on the standardized sample name um, or any genes or features that you want to work with. And then we, as pharma in PharmacoGX, container, put that in one slot, right? That's our molecular profiles that you see over there. So if you ever see a Pharmaco set, which you will, um, there's a molecular profile slot, which is essentially just a list of summarized experiments. And if there's one in particular that you want, you can just subset that. You can ignore the rest. Really, give, we, we try to give you an option to like work with whatever you want to, um, but standardize it in a way that it's familiar and consistent throughout. Um, does this, anything about this confusing? I know it might be confusing, so feel free to ask any questions and I can try to explain. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what, what do you mean? Which name you mean? Like, um, you mean like, oh, so we have multi assay experiment and summarize experiment? Is that what you're asking? Or these are all packages, they're all in packages, actually. I should say that as well. So, multi assay experiment is a package on Bioconductor. Summarized experiment is also a package in Bioconductor. And you kind of work with both of those to create these bigger objects. Summarized experiment? Oh, yeah. The pharmaco set? Oh, it is the pharmaco set. Is that what you're, you're saying? Or like the whole thing is a pharmaco set. And then with to get access to each individual thing, you would use these functions. Um, I'll, we'll also go through this in the lab, but you use these functions and you can get access to just this object or just this object based on these names. Um, are you looking at the slides? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, we'll come back to it for sure. Um, similarly, I wanted to, go over the tumor human response experiment, which is similar, but not, um, it's specialized for what we're trying to do. So whereas in a summarized experiment, you have a sample by features um, matrix, in a treatment response, it's samples by treatments, right? Um, and on top of that, to get the format that we, is useful, we have samples which are consistent and standard but in the treatments we also you have to consider um the con concentration that's used so you can't just have like one content like one treatment and one sample because there's like eight or you know however many number of concentrations used so we combine those into rows so you'll have like you know Tylenol one milligram Tylenol two so you'll have every row will be its own treatment which has its benefits um and this was built to handle, you know, how large these experiments are. So the types of data that we work with, you're talking about like on the order of like 6 million rows um, of data for like a thousand cell lines, right? Which can 
add up computationally. So this was built with that in mind and built to handle those types of computations um, so that it can be reasonably done um, for this, these large data. And so this these uh, slots aren't as useful to know. Um, the package has also been built and this object has been built to be very user-friendly, I guess is the way. So to access these, you can still access it the same way with uh, this, these notations to get like the row data is any additional information you want might want to know about the drugs um, from the experiment. And so mm -hmm. if they, you know, um, they have might have a name for the drug and then they'll call it its own ID name in the in the experiment, but they'll have like different metadata for it as well that they provide, um, which might be useful. And so we try to include that. We give you the option. Um, we won't be working with that today because it's it actually ends up being quite rare for the type of uh, stuff we, we'll work with today. Um, similarly, we have extra annotation for the cell lines if they have, you know, the, in the experiment, this is experiment specific cell line metadata, I should say, where if, you know, it's in batches or done in a specific way, a specific date, any sort of thing, they'll add that here as well. So if you wanted to, um, we give you the liberty of like choosing if you want to compare only across a specific date or anything in, in these fields. Um, I'll, I'll just show you as examples later to in, in, the, in the modules. I'll start in the lab. Um, and then finally, we have assay, the assays. Like, like, like I said, we have um, samples by treatment. Um, that's your main assay, which is what you'll definitely have for the ones you'll be working with, at least, and the ones that we publish. But then we also create the ability to store any other assays that you want about this. And that can be like computed assays. So let's say, for example, you had... Um, all the raw data, which like, like that experiment we had where we had one cell line, one drug, um, one concentrate. And for every concentration, you had like five different um, experiments, right? You could create a another assay where you just take the average and you store it back. So now you have like the raw version, but then now you have like an averaged version, which that's what you want to work with. And that way you can store it and keep it. And you can then move on to the next part of your analysis. And you can iterate over these steps so that you're not wasting, you're not redoing steps that you don't need to. And you can store everything back in here. And if you want to distribute it, you can distribute it as well. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a lot of use cases here uh, before we talk about the functionality, but um, I think this is pretty important before we get to it. You had a question back there? Back question? No? Um, oh, quality control. Julia's gonna come take over for this. So I, also, I think I briefly mentioned this as well, but we try to give you as raw as data as possible, but from the data that we give, you might want to be performing quality control, your own quality control, um, and that's the decision that you guys will make. And Julia's gonna explain what that looks like and how you might do it on your end. Um, from, and, and we'll, in the lab, we'll go over from the structure that we, we built. Um, any questions before that? Okay, so um, I just want to preface by saying, like Jeremiah said, a lot of the piece sets that we curate, we're using the raw data, so um, we don't actually intensively go through in quality control because we also want people to have the data as it was coming from the source. But a lot of the sources that we use, so the larger ones like GDSE and CCLE, they have already mostly done a lot of quality control. And so when you're looking at the data sets, um here or we we sort of introduced our own problem so that we have stuff to do but when you're actually using the data sets you won't notice too many issues with it but when you're taking data from other sources so maybe smaller institutions or in-house data um the first step is always quality control and it's one of the most important steps because again like i said earlier the quality of your results is a reflection of the quality of the data that you feed into your um, model or pipeline or code um and so for the rest of the workshop, we're going to talk about different methods or different sort of concerns or considerations that you may want to think about when you're doing quality control. Um, and again, there's no right or wrong answer. It is a very difficult um, field because um, you'll see, but it's really hard to sort of dictate what the right thing to do is and what the right decision is. Um, so everything that I'm teaching here, when you take it to your own practice, there is a lot of research and sort of just considerations that you have to do on your part. Okay, 
So quality control of pharmacogenomics data. Um, I guess we can sort of talk about the importance of quality control. I probably actually already must mentioned this, but molecular data, especially when you're looking in cell lines, but also within patients, it's very noisy. Um, and the problem with that is you're trying to identify signal from noise. So what is actually biologically meaningful versus what is just um, the cell was just being weird. Um, and it's really hard to tell. Sometimes you can't even tell. So you just have to make your best judgment and again, do your research, um, sort of just make the best call that you can. Um, the next thing is that data collection is very difficult and there's a lot of room for errors and missing values. This is especially, especially relevant when you're doing patient data um, because things can arise all the time. You have patients coming in. Sometimes you lose into follow-up. Sometimes um, like the readings aren't right, things just go wrong. And so sometimes when you're looking at data, you have missing values or you have values that look a bit weird. And then it's up to you to figure out, is this a correct value and it's just like an off patient or is this a wrong value? Um, and then also, this is sort of what I was mentioning, biases from your training data can be perpetuated into your results. And that's why it's really important for you to have good quality data and get that sort of set before you sort of go downstream um, and do things with it. Um, yeah, biomarker predictions are only as good as the data used to derive them. And that's sort of the preface um, for the next section. Um, so I'll be talking about a few sort of things that you can go into. There's other quality control measures that are important, um, but these are sort of the most common, I would say. So the first is the concept of outliers. Um, and this is the idea that data points um, that sort of sort of deviate from the other observations and you can identify this mathematically or visually. So in this example here, if all your data is clustering in one corner and all of a sudden you have these two on the extremes, it's likely that they're outliers. Um, but again, I really, really wanna emphasize, emphasize that you can't just look at it, say, okay, this looks off and then remove it. You always have to look into it. A really cool example that I actually saw recently was I think it was a distribution of patients with melanoma, melanoma which is a type of skin cancer. And so all the patients were sort of clustering here and then there was like a one-off data point. And obviously your first thought is, okay, this is probably wrong. It's like everyone is here, one patient all the way over there. But then when you actually look into it, this patient actually was just really unlucky and developed some mutation and they got melanoma on their foot. So like the bottom of their foot, that area has never seen the sun before. Um, so all these patients sort of acquired the mutations through UV, I actually don't know how melanoma works, but some sort of sun-related process. Um, so there's that type of melanoma, but then you also have another where it developed um, through some other mutational process. So it's not actually wrong data, it's different for a reason, and you never know, maybe in the future another patient will get a melanoma on their feet, so you want to keep that data point um, because it is actually giving you some important information. Okay, that was a tangent, but um, like I said, or like that story sort of implied, handling your outliers really depends on the source. So if the outlier came from a technical error, maybe someone was doing the readings and just accidentally there was a typo or maybe the machine wasn't calibrated properly, um, things like that, mistakes from the technician, curation, data generation, then in that case, you can probably argue to remove the outlier because you're not actually capturing bio biological noise, you're capturing some sort of technical um, error. But if the outlier came from something with biological signal, so that's the example of the patient with the melanoma on the foot, you may actually benefit from keeping that sample. It depends on your question, obviously. Um, but just take home messages. Don't be too quick to discard your outliers. There might actually be information there that you would use in your um, downstream analysis. Um, yeah, always dive into your outliers. That is a take home message. Okay, the next is the idea of normalization. Um, and this is sort of a process that people do to remove artifacts and noise from the biological data. Um, and essentially the idea here is when you're doing all these experiments, when you're doing the RNA-seq, when you're doing the um, arrays, these technologies are very sort of um, sensitive. And so even when you're running, um, for example, one single chip or one single array, um, you will have these biases that are introduced in just like the chip placement where the cell is on the chip, um, things like that. And you can actually capture that if you just quickly sort of plot, here's an example, it's fake data, but um, if you just do a plot of, say, um, the distribution of counts for different samples, even though every sample is different, overall, um, you should have very similar trends. And so you can see here, even um, from just like this small figure, you can see there's sort of variations between your samples. Um, and if you know that on average, um, the counts 
average should be around a certain place, then you can tell that this data set probably needs some sort of normalization just to get everything on the same scale. And so you do a normalization um, method and there's various, I won't go into it, but do a method that's appropriate for your data just to bring everything on the same scale. And once everything um, looks good, only then can you actually capture variances that come from real biological signal versus just um, technical variations um, or artifacts. Yeah, that's a good question. And I asked that same question when I first learned this, but throughout, so think of your genome, right? It's huge. Um, even just little mutations here and there will not be enough to have drastic differences um, in the overall picture. Um, and so when you're plotting things like counts, for example, your counts across samples should actually align. That actually doesn't take out um, the information that you're looking for. Um, it more so just scales it so that when you do the comparison, the comparison's a bit more accurate. Yeah, you would expect that if you place them in genes, that you would have an average the same function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it also depends on the profile, right? So RNA seq, for example, um, it's large enough that um, you can expect this. But if you're doing something a bit more sensitive, so maybe like a specific count for one specific loci, in that case, differences actually might mean something. So then you wouldn't normalize. Yeah. So again, um, before you sort of perform any of the methods, do the research, look into exactly what your data is, what your question is, um, and there's there's tons of resources you can figure out really quickly if it's something that you need to apply or not. It's like for so many missions, we always need to learn mm -hmm. that how do you count the cell cycle? Because we know that the cells can be always more than a little bit, produce more than its genes. Yeah. So that's expected if yeah. they are in the same yeah. So that's actually something that's really interesting you brought that up because it's something our lab tried to implement because circadian rhythm also affects other readings as well. Um, and there's all papers that show this, but the problem is when you collect this data, Usually there's no information on when the sample was collected or um, when in the cell cycle the sample was processed. So you actually can't correct for it, that's the problem. So again, this all ties into the missing data, missing variables. Um, so we do the best that we can, but things like that, unless the data is available, which I've actually never seen it, you can't correct for it properly. But that's why, that's also why you need a big sample size um, so that you can kind of account for those variances that you can't adjust for. Yeah, to the same scenario with with cell cycle, that this is large enough, it should have, it shouldn't be a big variable. Yeah, you should have a good enough representation that it won't skew your data um, in any way. Yeah. Okay, was there any other questions here? And I just, I guess here I have some examples of, um, things that you may want to normalize for. Um, something we'll look into more detail is batch effects, so I won't talk on that now. Other things is scaling. So for example, when you're doing sequencing, you can pay a lot of money and have a huge coverage. So you sequence like a read five times and then you're 100% sure that your reads are right. Or you can put a little less money, you can sequence it just once. Um, things like that you have to account for because obviously if you sequence it five times, you have five times the coverage. Um, library size, uh, and I just put a few other things here, but again, it all just boils down to the data you're using and the question you're asking. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know if you can actually just use, so you're saying, for example, if it if they the paper tells you it's 30 times yeah, um, depth. Like 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah theoretically yes um it might not be best practice though i'm not actually sure yeah usually it's best if right off the sequencing machine um if people correct it Okay, batch effects. This is one of the um, concepts that you would apply normalization to. And a batch effect is essentially any technical non-biological factor that is sort of introducing variation in your data. Um, and it can come from things like, for example, if you have two technicians working in your lab, both of them generate data, you put them together and you can clearly see this one was one technician, this was another technician, just little errors or not even errors, but just differences in their procedures or techniques. Um, it can come from different sequencing protocols. If you're using RNA sequencing versus a microarray, that would also introduce some um, biases. Um, little things like that, that you know is not biological differences. It's more of just the methods or procedures that you use to get the data. So here's an example if um, say, going back to the technician example, if I had one technician run a bunch of experiments, another technician run a bunch of the experiments, if I plot the data together and I can very clearly see here was the data from one technician, here was the data from another technician, you know that the samples aren't different. Um, and so this error or this difference has to be coming from the methods or the approaches that they were using. So something we can do is something called batch effect correction, where it's basically, I believe it uses a linear model and it's able to sort of scale the data in a sense where it puts the data into the same almost, um, I don't want to say dimensions, probably just scale in that sense where you remove that technical variation. And now all that's left, the only differences that you're seeing in your data is actually the real biological noise um, in the actual models or cells or whatever you're using. And we'll go into some examples of this in the lab today. Okay, and then I think this is the last case example I'm bringing up, but the concept of missing values, something I alluded to earlier was the fact that during data collection, things can come up and sometimes you just don't have um, the values. If it's, this can come up really um, in anywhere. It can come up in your molecular data, your response data, um, and also your metadata. So for example, in the molecular data, if you're running it through the machine and the machine just happens to bug out at some point and maybe a gene call can be read. read. Or maybe you're doing your response data and a cell, um, the cell line just doesn't react properly. And so you don't have a proper value for a given drug. You would just get an NA there. Um, and in the metadata, maybe you're collecting, um, maybe you're working with patient data and the patient refuses to fill out some form. So you don't actually have their sex or their age or some other variable, you would get NA there. So usually when you're working with data, you'll see a lot of NA values. Um, and then the question becomes, what do you do with this? NA value, do you fill it in? Do you remove the patient completely? It's really tricky because obviously if your data is limited, you don't wanna just remove everyone that has an NA because then you won't have any data to work with. But then if you have NA values and you try to sort of convert into something, how do you do that correctly? And how do you not actually just introduce bias yourself into the process? Um, so really there's, there's two things you can do. You can either remove or you can do something called impute where you take a look at the rest of the data and you try to figure out based on the trends, what that NA value probably was. Um, usually there's no sort of standard on when to do what, but the general rule is you should probably set a threshold. If you see something like this, where this entire column just has, it's 50% NAs, that's probably an indication that you should remove it. Um, but if you have like one or two or three sparse NAs here and there, you could consider imputation. Um, it's it's sort of a tricky field to go into. You definitely have to do your research um, and also just know whenever you do imputations, you are in some way introducing some bias into your data. And that's just something that you have to account for. Um, a lot of the work that we have in our labs and in downstream analysis, even in other bioinformatics um, fields, a lot of the methods actually have ways to account for the NAs. So they would just not run um, on the NA values. And so for, at least what we're doing, um, we don't have to worry too much about the one or two NA values, but obviously if you have a sample that just has a bunch of NAs, there was probably something wrong that happened in the process. So just good to remove it. So very quickly on imputations, um, just because it is something that comes up pretty often, it's not 
always the best way to deal with your data. And so, like I mentioned, if it's non-random, like the sample here, probably best to remove it. Um, otherwise, best practice is to set some sort of threshold. And again, it's an arbitrary threshold. You sort of choose your value yourself. Um, and if it meets that threshold, then you go ahead and impute. I attached this um, here. It's a very thorough workshop that goes over imputation. So if you ever run into this problem, um, it's always good to go into it. It's too much information for our workshop. Um, but at the end of the day, it is your decision. And so you just have to do your best research and decide the method that makes the most sense um, for your work. OK. Was there any questions on any of that that I just discussed? Yeah, I guess take home points um, from this presentation first is that there are many, many data types and sources available and needed for pharmacogenomic biomarker analysis. Um, we went over a few in our lab earlier. We showed some today. There's a lot to handle. And so we have um, pharmacosets that Jemaya presented that really helps us sort of facilitate data storage and analysis using our PharmacoGX package. Um, our lab will sort of demo that and you can see the utility for yourself. And then what I discussed just now was the many quality control steps and considerations that are necessary um, to ensure that you have high quality data for your biomarker discovery. We have about 10 minutes, so if there's no other questions, we can probably start a break early. Okay. I'll actually say something before we leave. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in general, at least today and this module, there's going to be a lot of stuff that like you're not going to become an expert of, to be like, fair, right, in the next two hours. Um, but it really is, like the I would say one of the objectives, which I didn't write down, is like providing you with the tools to be able to figure stuff out and um, an, an idea of like what exists out there, right? So you've seen like, now you've seen like multi ass experiments, summarized experiments. Um, the field's really cool where people have come up with a lot of cool solutions for a lot of different problems that you'll see. And um, it really is a matter of being resourceful. Uh, and so actually, I'll show you guys bioconductor type, not bioconductor. So this is a website for all the pack our packages. Um, I will also show you they have their repository of all the packages that they have. And if you click on any of them, I'll keep go to the PharmacoGX one, which is right here. So part of this is, um, a part of being in this field is understanding what you're working with and being resourceful, like I said. A lot of packages in Bioconductor and what we are trying to do now is provide um, resources to help you understand what you're working with. And one of them is like a manual of everything that you could possibly do with this package. And so when you look at, you're talking about like, all right, what parameters does this function take? You know, what types are these parameters? What does this function return? Um, all those questions you can see in the documentation um, of any package you're really working with. And so if at any point you're working with um, a certain package, certain object, or you come across something, I highly recommend just really going through the documentation. Um, you'll learn so much more than just copy pasting someone else's solution. Um, out, so I found, right? Um, even building this workshop, I've learned so much more about our own packages that I just never looked saw before because I never um, had access to it. And a lot of times, what you've we've shown you as well for the labs um, in our workshop website are what we call vignettes, um, which are kind of like more user-friendly health documentation. So you'll often see vignettes with a package that kind of go through, you know, examples or working within different use cases with, with um, real fake data. And we try to include that as well. And so when you're working with a new package or you are curious about what a package does, these are your resources. Um, and so today in the next module, maybe even tomorrow, if you are wondering how, you know, how to access something, how to, what, what methods could you use on these objects, try the documentation, see what, see what works. Um, 
not all documentation is made equally. I'll be honest. Some could use work. So sometimes it might be confusing. That's where you just provide feedback if possible. But um, yeah, I think that's the big thing. I recommend going through these at any point. There's one for the multi-asset experiment and one for the summarized experiment as well. So you can go through that at any, any given point if you have any questions. That is, they've curated those for a while and have really good documentation there. So um, yeah, that's it. Um, I'll let you guys take your break and we'll come back. Oh, actually, before the website for the workshop has the module two lab R markdowns. We have the markdown for the entire lab, which we'll go through as an empty file and a complete file, but there is also an empty markdown for just the exercises, which are just like um, separate, like take home exercises, I'd say. Um, so if you can install, uh, download all three of them before um, we come back, um, that'd be good. Cool, everyone good? Any questions?